All right, turn please in the word of God to Ephesians chapter 4. And so I, I promised you about 45 minutes, so we're going to go to about the top of the hour. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. Now, the last time I spoke here, we took a hiatus from Ephesians and diverted into John because I was speaking to Canada. You remember that was the first ever hybrid meeting in the history of Grace Gospel Chapel, Gilbertsville. So it was a historic occasion. And I think all of you were here. So that was a a tremendous thing. Uh, But anyway, the saints up there appreciated the word. And so I thank you again for going along with that. Uh, experience. But now we're returning to our regular study in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. We'll read in the Word of God. It speaks about our Lord there. It says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come to the unity of the faith of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. I want to think with you this morning about becoming mature. Now, some time ago, we thought about these different gifts that the risen Christ has given to the church. The Lord rose up and led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. This is Ephesians 4's quotation of Psalm 68. And so we see that in his redemptive work in dying and rising again and achieving this triumph, the Lord has given gifts to the church. And we're explicitly told why these gifts were given in verse 12. It's for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. Now, we noted before that that's different than what the majority of Christians out there seem to think about the nature of the church. And it's kind of funny. Sometimes I hear people listen widely to a lot of podcasts and a lot of sermons from different places. And I appreciate the various gifted men in whatever kind of church they're preaching in. But in churches that have that clergy laity distinction, which we don't find in the New Testament, you'll hear sometimes one of their preachers say, now, you know, we're not to do all the work here. We're to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And and they're quite correct. But the problem is that the very system of having a man or a group of men that you're paying to be the professionals who are going to do the service, that inclines toward the man in the pew saying, well, I don't have to do it. They do it. And especially in the modern so-called church growth movement, which is really the shuffling the deck movement, because while God is sovereign and can use any place where the word of God is preached to save somebody, and we rejoice in every place that preaches the true gospel. And like Philippians 1 says, Paul said, I rejoice that Christ is preached. But that notwithstanding, if you read the statistics on church growth, it is usually people moving from one evangelical church to another. And so a lot of these big churches have grown by eating smaller churches. Smaller congregations have folded. The people have gone to the big church. Why? Because the big church has a better staff, a better infrastructure. They can take care of all the problems. You don't have to be involved. You don't have to worry about it. You come, it's a user-friendly experience. The coffee is probably better there too, for all I know. I don't know. But anyway, uh, maybe better tea for you tea drinkers. But that's not the, the idea that we see in the New Testament. The idea of these gifts, the apostles and prophets who Ephesians 2 tells us were given for the foundation of the church. They were uniquely involved with giving us the lasting legacy, even the book that is the 
our marching orders and our, our manual of what to do. The Bible, the word of God came from the apostles and the prophets. And so the church is laid on the foundation of that work that they did. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And the apostles would always say, you know, our doctrine is really his. We got it from the Lord. Just like the Lord said in John 16, he would send the comforter and he would, in John 14, he said he would bring all things to your remembrance. In John 16, he said he would guide you into all truth. So when we talk Acts 2.42 about the apostles doctrine or what the apostles taught, it was the teaching of the risen Christ passed down to them. And then the apostles have passed it on to us. Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians 15 when he says, I delivered unto you that which I also received. Now, where did he receive it from? He makes it clear in Galatians 1, he didn't receive it primarily from Peter or the other apostles. He didn't receive it from the churches of Judea and Jerusalem. He received it directly from Christ. He said, the gospel that I preach is not according to man, but is by revelation. In other words, God directly revealed it to Paul. And that was for the unique historical dispensational reason that Paul was going to be the apostle to the Gentiles and the one, as he said in Ephesians 3, who would have the great privilege of revealing that mystery that Christ is building a church composed of Jew and Gentile. And so what wasn't known before has now been made known through the apostles and the prophets. And the apostles and the prophets, along with the teachers and the pastors and the evangelists, are all gifts that are given to equip the saints for the ministry. In other words, they put the tools in the hands of the saints and prepare the saints to serve. And we don't all serve the same way because there's a variety of gifts. And even two believers having the same gift may use it differently because the gift is, after all, filtered through their personality, their circumstance, their opportunities, and the unique kind of service that the Lord wants them to do. I've never been in the military, but I've always admired the military from a little child. And mom can tell you that I used to like to, when I was six, seven, eight years old, or even a little older, send in these recruitment brochures to the different recruiters to get more information. That led to some interesting things, like the week I turned nine or ten, we had a recruiting sergeant call the house on the phone and ask to speak with me. And my mom was a bit... Uh, confused as to why Sergeant so-and-so from the United States Army would want to talk to me. And he said, well, he's sending a brochure. I want to talk to him about joining the Army. And she said, well, he's turning nine this week. And there was silence on the other end. And he kind of chuckled and he said, tell him to call us in about 10 years. So anyway, I never got around to calling because I'm what they used to call 4F. So physically unfit to serve. But that notwithstanding, I think about the Army there are quite a few sergeants in the army. I don't know how many, but I put it in the thousands conservatively. There are many different sergeants, but not all sergeants do the same things, do they? You have a sergeant in a motor pool battalion. He's presiding over a group of mechanics and maybe a few clerical people as well to make sure that the vehicles are kept in working order. You have a sergeant in a tank battalion. He might be riding up on top as a tank commander in the turret with a gun right out at the forefront of wherever the invasion's happening. You have a sergeant in the commissary. He's presiding over the kitchen and making sure the chefs and bakers are doing what they should. You see what I mean? They're all sergeants, but they each have a different work depending on where they're placed in the army. And it's the same thing with spiritual gift. So that's wonderfully liberating. Because although in one way I love church history and I look back and I read a lot of the biographies of the great saints whom the Lord has used from the Bible onwards, and we could think about some of the great preachers in even the most recent centuries, Whitfield and the Wesleys and Moody and Spurgeon and Darby and some of these great figures. And I say to myself, well, I'm not like any of them. And God says to me, that's fine because I didn't create you to be them. You're not in their situation, in their time, in their place. You're to be you. 
And we can look at other people, and there's no problem with looking at others and getting inspired in their service, or as Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, imitate me as I imitate Christ. We want to emulate the faith of others in our Lord. That's true. But ultimately, whatever gift we're given, we're to use it for the work of the ministry. We're to work it, and ministry there isn't professionalism in Christianity. Ministry just means service. And the end in view is the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, that's a very important concept. Edifying means upbuilding. And the metaphor here is of a building that's being built. When this chapel building was built, most of you weren't here in fellowship. Some of you were, but the majority, I think, this morning weren't. But I was here. I was only seven, but I was here. It was 1980. And there were a number of brothers in this fellowship that participated in building this building. My late father's company was involved in it. So my dad did some of the work. My brother, who unfortunately isn't here, uh, he did some of the work. Um, We can think about our late brother Clarence Knepp did some of the cabinets. And Ken Perkey, who now lives out in Oregon, he did a lot of the elect, uh, no, sorry, the engineering work. And Buddy Nyman did all kinds of things. I don't even know what all he did. And Mr. Elwanger did things. And Mr. Widener, I think, did things. And many other brethren and some sisters contributed in one way or another as they were able And through them, this building got built. And and of course, there were people that gave money and people that prayed. And so this building is here. Now think of the church. The church is here by the edifying of the gifts. That the gifts equip the saints to serve. And the saints, by serving, are involved in that work of building up the church. What's called here the body of Christ. So it's not just a building. We have that idea of the body. Now, I've never been a great athlete, but again, I admire them. And sometimes I watch these 30 for 30 programs on ESPN or, or the NFL has NFL stories or something. You know, they talk about a great football player. And it's amazing when you think about that man or woman that you see doing a sport on television, maybe in the Olympics, maybe in a professional league, that there's a veritable army of trainers at work on these people. Just watch it if one of them gets hurt. Let's use football since we're in football season. One of these great multi-million dollar backs is running and suddenly gets knocked down and whoa, he's not getting up. Suddenly there's four guys that swoop down on him, not players. These are guys that come off the sidelines. There'll be a medical doctor. There might be an EMT. There's certainly a sports medicine trainer there. And they're examining this guy and seeing what's going on with him. Now, that's what happens when he gets hurt. What about in the lead up to the game? What about in the off season even? Well, Tom Brady, who's notoriously obsessed with preparation, he has a guy that for years now he's paid over six figures a year to follow him around and design a custom-made nutritional plan. And he only eats certain types of foods certain times of years and cold foods versus hot foods and paleo and who knows what else. And and this guy gives him special massages and special rub downs and all this kind of thing. And and here's a guy who's made a very uh, respectable living and he's just living for the physical conditioning of Tom Brady. You know, the teams also have other people that they train people on lifting weights or they train them on the treadmill. They're going to train their cardio or they're going to be strength and conditioning coaches. I stayed with a brother once in Connecticut. That was what his son-in-law did. His son-in-law had played college football, but he wasn't good enough to make it in the pros or didn't have that opportunity or whatever the case was. So he got a job as a strength and conditioning coach for the Indianapolis Colts. And he was there, you know, making sure the guys had the right workout regimen. And and when I tell you there's an army of these guys, it's not really an exaggeration. There's a whole organization for every team where groups of these guys take up a person and say, now we're going to build this guy up. We're going to make him as strong, as fast, as agile as he can be. And that's just the physical part, never mind the mental part that the coaches are working on, trying to teach him how to play his position better. Well, think of the body of Christ that way, that we are all to be trying to get ourselves in the game and to perform at the highest level. 
That we, in other words, are concerned not just to, you know, know one another socially, but concerned to pray for one another, concerned to encourage one another, concerned to admonish one another if needed, concerned to rebuke one another perhaps if needed. Again, all very carefully under the leading of the Lord. And again, some of it gift specific, but all to that greater job of edifying or building up the body of Christ. Till we all come, says verse 13, to the unity of the faith. Now, when he says the faith, we're not talking about faith subjectively. In other words, not what we, uh, not the fact that we Christians believe. Like I could say I have faith that the Redskins are going to win today. I don't actually know if my faith's that strong. But anyway, I could make that statement. And what I'm talking about is that that's my personal belief, right? I have this subjective belief. But when the Bible talks about the faith, such as in Jude, when it speaks of the faith once delivered to the saints, that we are to earnestly contend for the faith once delivered to the saints. This is the body of doctrine. This is the truth that Christians believe. So what do Christians believe? We believe the faith. Well, what does the faith include? Well, the faith is, as W.H. Griffith Thomas said in the title of one of his old books, Christianity is Christ. When you ask, what is a Christian? We don't want to just say to the pollster, I'm a Christian or I'm an evangelical, because if polls show anything, it's that people take words and they make them mean anything they want them to mean. So we have people saying, I'm an evangelical, But then they'll say they don't believe in the deity of Christ or I'm an evangelical and they don't believe the Bible is God's word. Now, that makes no sense. That's like a Marxist who believes in Walmart and capitalism. You know, Uh, they're non sequitur. They don't go together, ideologically speaking. So we have to understand when we talk about the faith, this is believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, believing the body of truth that he has revealed and is given to the church through the Holy Spirit. So this includes the fact that there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. That if somebody says to us, oh no, there are millions of gods. Or if somebody says there are three gods. Or if somebody tells us, you're a little God. We can deny all of that and say, no, We believe in the faith. We believe in the body of truth given by Christ. We believe in the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, the God whom Christ shows to us. He says, have not I been with you? He that, and yet you've not known me. He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. He said in John 14. So the faith flows out of who Christ is. He is the eternal Son of God. That God is one God, but in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That God sent his Son into the world, and he became a true man. That the Lord Jesus has come in the flesh, in other words, in a physical body. That being found in fashion as a man, he became the bondservant of the Lord, the one who was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And we believe that the cross wasn't just an accident of history. It wasn't a human mistake. It wasn't people somehow not on purpose putting the Son of God on the cross. Yes, they were in a sense ignorant. They were in a sense blind. But they are also culpable that they put the Lord Jesus on the cross. But we believe also that we are culpable because we say, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. So we say with the modern hymn writer, it was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. And so we say, yes, he died for our sins, according to the scriptures. We say he was buried and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. We say he ascended up on high, that he's now in heaven. Christ has entered into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God. Angels and principalities and powers being made subject to him. First Peter 3.22. And so this is the faith. We believe the Lord Jesus is coming again because the Lord said, If I go away, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. We believe in the church, which is his body. That we are 
knit together with every believer in the Lord Jesus Christ from the day of Pentecost in the first century in Acts chapter 2 on to the present moment and extending into the future to whenever the rapture may come, we are one body with that church. So wherever we find a true believer, whatever the name on the building, whatever other things may be different between us and them, if they truly are born again by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, they're our brother, they're our sister, and so forth. And we believe these things. This is the faith that's been delivered to the church, the body of Christ. Now, verse 13 says, till we all come to the unity of the faith. And at the beginning of the chapter, he spoke about this faith. He he spoke there about the unity of the spirit in verse three, which already existed. He said, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit. So it's something that already exists. The spirit has brought about this unity in the church in the bond of peace. Then he says in verse four, there's one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, please notice one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. So there's this great confession at the beginning of the chapter. And Paul says, yes, that's what we want. The object of the church is not just to replicate, not just to see new parts added to the body. I mean, the body's doing that all the time, right? That we are adding to the body constantly. You say, oh yeah, Thanksgiving is a big time to adding to the body. Well, I know what you mean. But I mean even at the cellular level. Cells are reproducing. Cells are dying, but they're also reproducing. And the body keeps going on and it keeps progressing. And the image he has here of a body growing up into maturity until we all come to the unity of faith. Now the Bible understands that we come out of different backgrounds that we are different personalities, that we have different cultures even, and that when we come to Christ, in a sense, the faith is the rallying point because that's the faith that the Lord Jesus Christ gave us. That's the doctrine, the teaching that he gave to us. And so as believers, we believe in what Christ has given to us through his apostles. But then there has to be the unity of that faith where we all come to know what the faith is. Now, did you know all the doctrines of Christianity when you got saved? I didn't know all the doctrines of Christianity when I got saved. And having gotten saved in a Christian home and grown up in this assembly, I had heard years and years of preaching, probably hundreds, if not thousands of messages in my life by that time. My parents had read books to me, had read the Bible to me, had spoken to me about various doctrines, had answered questions. But did I completely and exhaustively know everything that the Bible teaches that the Lord wants me to know? Absolutely not. And I don't think anybody does when they get saved. Saul might have been pretty close who became Paul because he had such a great knowledge of the scripture. But even he, the Lord had to reveal to him this new truth that nobody else had at that time. So we come and we're being added into this body, but now we've got to all come, or some translate it, all attain to the unity of the faith. The object of this truth is to unify us. That Christians aren't to be arguing about the person of Christ. They aren't to be arguing about the nature of the church and what we are to do. That we're to have that unity of belief. We hold to these doctrines. And and that's a process. Because as 1 Corinthians exhorts them in chapter 1, he wants them to all think the same thing. Or Philippians 2 has that same attitude, that they all have this attitude which was in Christ Jesus, that they all have the mindset of putting others first by the Lord's example that we say, I've got to help this other brother or sister. It's not mainly about me. I've got to help them grow in the Lord and I'm going to put their needs first. I'm going to try to advantage them or prefer them in spiritual things. Now he goes on to say, and of the knowledge of the Son of God. And there's a nuance in the original language there about knowledge. It's the idea of full knowledge. And I was doing meetings earlier this week in North Carolina on the book of Colossians. The Lord gave much help in the word. It was a good trip. But this word full knowledge occurs repeatedly in Colossians. Because the false teachers were coming. And they were saying, you know, we've got a knowledge that you don't have. 
And if you come and imbibe our teaching, well, then you'll really understand. And this is the danger. When you start going away from the Bible, away to other things, and you say, well, this is a valid pursuit of truth. No, no. Truth is right here. This is where we get truth, God's word. And so, yes, I understand we study textbooks in school. Yes, I understand there are things written about history and other things that aren't in the Bible. And I'm not saying it's wrong to read them. But when we come back to spiritual truth, when we come back to our identity as believers and what the church is, the faith, we come back to God's word. Because the living word, Jesus Christ, our Lord, he's called the word in John one in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. That one, the word who became flesh and dwelt among us, John one fourteen, he's revealed in the written word. God has spoken in many parts and in many ways in days of old to the fathers in the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us in son is what Hebrews one, one and two would say to us. So he's speaking through the Lord Jesus Christ. Michael Card said it in a song. He spoke the incarnation and then so was born the son. The father's um, sorry, the father's word was Jesus. He needed no other one. <laughs> His final word was Jesus. That's how it goes. His final word was Jesus. He needed no other one. I like that idea. The Lord Jesus is the word, the final word God has on what the truth is, on what the universe is about, on what we human beings are to do. And God wants us to grow in the full knowledge of the son of God. It's like growing up in a family. Now, you think back to your parents and not everybody grows up in a two parent household. I realize that. But if you had two parents, that's a blessing from God. If you had two parents who are believers, that's even more of a blessing. And that's a blessing for which I thank God. But even though I knew my parents all my life, I always was learning more about my parents. I mean, did you progress after you were born? Did you learn more about your parents? I mean, I can't even remember when I was born. My memory's decent, but it's not that good. I suppose, knowing what I know about newborns, that my parents were revealed to know about changing diapers. Because I'm told I messed up a number of those as a little child. And I know from my memory that I can recall that from the time I was three, four, and so forth, that my parents were teaching me verses of scripture, teaching me songs about the faith, teaching me about the Lord Jesus. They wanted me to get saved, first of all, and they wanted me then to grow in Christ. And I began to learn more about my parents, the good, the bad, and the ugly, we might say. Ah, no, sorry, anyway, wrong thing. The good, the bad, and the ugly. What I mean by that is the things where the Lord was working through them. That's the good. The bad, well, unfortunately, my parents were still fallen human beings. They still had the flesh. The flesh wars against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. No such thing as perfect parents. And we're not perfect parents. Those who are presently parents. There's no perfect grandparents or great grandparents because there's no perfect people, right? We're all sinners. We all need the Lord. And so there was the bad. Now, the ugly is just the natural state of being a human being in a fallen world. And you got to go through stuff. And when people are sick, they're not always at their prettiest, are they? And yet I got to know my parents more through those experiences. Now think of the church this way. We're growing up into the full knowledge of the Son of God. Here's the difference. The Son of God has no bad and no ugly. First John 1 says, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. The Lord Jesus is that spotless Lamb of God. So there's no bad that we dread Oh, one day I'm going to find out that the Lord Jesus has a skeleton in his closet. Not so. There's nothing bad, nothing that we need to reproach our Lord for, only good. There's nothing ugly either. Even though when he came on earth, men didn't think there was any beauty in him. Isaiah 53 talks about that. When we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. In other words, he wasn't their idea of a king. 
He wasn't their idea of a great leader. He wasn't a man's man in the sense that he's going to live like a human being of this terrestrial earth who lives according to the course of this world. He was a true man in every sense of the word, albeit a perfect man and impeccable, incapable of sinning because he was the incarnate son of God. And what he was was a man who always did the will of the father. So the Lord Jesus had no ugly. He was truly beautiful. Or we might say in Song of Songs language, he was altogether lovely. And he remains so. Praise be to his name. So think about it. If we're growing to come to the unity of the faith, this is our rallying point. We don't rally around our favorite football team because a number of my Christian friends have not yet been enlightened. They like the Dallas Cowboys. And many of you Eagles fans even can shudder at that thought. Uh, Where we don't rally around food because we have vastly different opinions on that, right? We don't rally around our ethnicity. We rally around the truth as it is in the Lord. And as we grow, we get to know the Son of God more and more. Now look at what we're growing to a perfect man. Now we should stop and define what the New Testament here means by perfect. Not again, a man who is sinless in this life because there's no such thing. And again, this is a metaphor. We're talking about the church corporately. Are there any local churches that are perfect? Are there any that are sinless? No, not any more than there are any perfect individual Christians. Okay, but what the idea here is, the scholars tell us who've studied the language in depth, they tell us the idea is maturity. So we want this body to come up to full growth, to be a full grown man to the measure of of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, there was a time in this meeting when children in this meeting would measure themselves by a dear sister, now long with the Lord, Inez Stevens. She was a very godly woman and a wonderful friend to me and to our family in general. But Mrs. Stevens, for those who knew her, you will recall she was diminutive. Uh, Let's just call it like it is. She was short. Okay, and back at the coffee break, you remember coffee breaks. We trust by faith they'll come again when this virus is behind us uh, or when things get a little safer. But in any case, when there were coffee breaks every week, the children in this meeting, they would sneak up behind Mrs. Stevens. And Mrs. Stevens was probably four foot nine in heels. And I'm being generous. Uh, But the dear lady, she'd be standing there chatting away with uh, maybe one of you with a cup of coffee in her hand. And one of the kids, I'd see my niece and nephew do this frequently. They'd kind of sneak up behind her and they'd kind of look over their shoulder. Am I as tall as Mrs. Stevens yet? Because somehow to a kid, being as tall as an adult, that's a big deal, right? I want to grow up to be as tall as an adult. But... More personally, I remember my dad in his prime was about six feet. My grandfather was even taller than that in his prime. And I used to think, oh, I would just love to grow up to be as tall as my dad. Didn't happen. (laughs) I'm short, obviously. I didn't make it. But that was the standard. And not just in stature physically, but I wanted to be like my dad. I wanted to be a hardworking man who was loyal to his family, a man who was loyal to the assembly, a man who wanted to help other people. And my dad was a sinner like anybody else. My dad had faults and flaws that the Lord was working on virtually to the day he took him. So I'm not here under any sentimental illusions. If he had lived uh, on the 15th of this month, just past, he would have been 80. The Lord took him at 70. We're coming up on the 10 year anniversary. But as a kid, I looked up to my dad and I said, that's what I want to grow up to be like. I want to be that kind of guy. Now, not everybody, again, has a father in the home or a father that is a good father. There are, sadly, in this world, fathers that are abusive. There are dysfunctional families. And again, even the best of our fathers are men at best, aren't they? They're still fallen. They're still flawed. That's every one of us. But... When we look at the Lord Jesus Christ, it's different. When we talk about the church growing up into a maturity, growing up to be like somebody, the standard here is the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, he says. That the Lord wants the church to grow up to be just like the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as you read your Gospels, 
and you look at the beautiful life of the Lord Jesus, it ought to make your pulse quicken a little bit and say, Lord, that's how I'd like to live. That's how I'd like to be. I wish I were more like the Lord Jesus. And that's indeed what God is doing in the church. He's building us up collectively, each individual part of it, but all of us corporately as well, all of us together to make us a full grown person, a mature person, what he calls here a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, don't you like that? Not just diet Christ as if we're going to have a few of the qualities of the Lord. But when the Lord presents the church to himself, he uses the image in chapter five of a bride. And he says when he presents it to himself, he's going to present us without spot or blemish or any such thing. Now, that's every bride's nightmare. She wakes up on the morning of her wedding and there's a huge zit on the end of her nose. Oh, horrors, you know, there's suddenly some of those specialists that I was talking about when I spoke about the athletes, they're called in to help the bride. I don't know what arcane arts they use to conceal that blemish, but oh, you don't want that in the wedding photo, you know? You don't want people to be looking at that as you're walking down the aisle or rip sticking down the aisle, whatever people do nowadays. Anyway, but here's the beautiful thing. We're going to be presented without spot or without blemish or any such thing. But we're also going to be presented according to the measure of the fullness of Christ. In other words, the Lord is filling out the church to be like him. Darby said, all like thee, for thy glory like thee, Lord, object supreme of all by all adored. Not that we're going to be co-equal with the Lord Jesus in our attributes and in our true ultimate worth. Not, all, not that we're ever going to be God in that sense. We're not going to be equal to the Father and the Son and the Spirit. But we are going to be alongside the Lord in this sense. Joint heirs, says Romans 8, with the Lord Jesus. Inheriting with him the earth. Ruling over the earth in the millennial kingdom with him. And then in the new heavens and the earth... Being with the Lord forever. Wonderful, tremendous goal of maturity that's happening here in this process. And then he puts the contrast in verse 14. That we should be no longer children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Now, children today tend to be idealized in our culture. In other words, children are the ones who are always right. They're the smart ones because they, after all, know how to work a tablet computer and older people don't, right? So children are the great ones of our culture. But we younger people, and I'm not younger anymore, but I once was. I can remember it. It wasn't that long ago. When, when I was young, <laughs> I had to continually remind myself, don't listen to the culture. Your elders, the people older than you, have more experience. They've walked with the Lord, if they know the Lord. They've walked with him longer than you. Proverbs says, the hoary head or the white head is a crown of glory if it be found in the way of righteousness. So take that just for men. The white haired person, I'm not looking at anyone in particular. I'm looking all around this morning, is someone we need to respect it's like someone wearing a crown. We'd say this is royalty. This is a leader. This is someone we need to look to because they've been down the road before. And over and over, the Bible tells us that. Listen to the people that have experience with the Lord. Now, it's a principle in the world, too, that people that have been down the road before you can teach you things. But people in the world don't always want to teach you good things. That's the problem. But when we talk about believers, the older ones, we want to give special you know, uh, esteem and honor to them. And spiritually, he doesn't want the church to be children any longer. And by the way, the Bible's not anti-child, but the Bible knows that we don't know everything when we're born. No, none of us springs out of Zeus's head like Athena, fully formed and wise, you know, the mythical goddess of Greek wisdom. None of us is like that. We come into the world barely knowing anything. And we need, therefore, to be taught. And same thing with the church. Now, when we're children, what's the vulnerability? He says, well, you can be tossed to and fro 
and carried about with every wind of doctrine. I remember our children, when they were little, we'd go to the ocean, frequently in the Bahamas. That's where they got most of their early swimming experience. But there were days when it was too rough, when the waves were coming in, and we said, no, you're not getting out in the water, because if you got out, you'd just get pushed around and pushed under, and it would be dangerous for you. And it's that way to the person in their infancy, or even the church in their infancy, tossed and to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Now notice this, by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. I wish I could tell you out there that everybody is interested in helping you. Everybody is interested in building up your faith in Christ. They're interested in forming your mind with correct doctrine to believe the right thing about the Lord, to know the Lord better, and to be able to serve you. That's what the gifts are for. They're to equip you, equip you to do that. But not everybody's going to do that to you because there are false teachers in the world. We don't live in a vacuum. So many people say, and I've had personal friends say, well, I want to follow the truth. And I see that the truth is not Christianity. It's out there somewhere in the world. I'm going to go seek the truth. Well, when somebody says that, that's an awful thing. Because you know, when you turn from the truth, there's no plan B. You're turned to fables, Second Timothy 4 says. And so these people are pictured pushed about by every wind, by the waves of doctrine. It's by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. People want to cheat us. Young people especially. Listen, people want to cheat you. They tell you it's better out there in the world. Or they tell you this or that doctrine that they're promoting is better. No, you come back to the word and you say, I want to hold to the faith, the unity of the faith. I want to come to the full knowledge of the son of God. I want to grow up in the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And if what you're teaching me doesn't agree with that, I don't want it. It's trickery. You're trying to dupe me. I don't want it. So conversely, What we're supposed to do, verse 15, the church, is but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things unto him who is the head, Christ. Now, you see, when truth isn't taught, when proper truth isn't maintained, you know what suffers? Growth. Think of the Bible like spiritual nutrition. Now, the Bible itself uses that example, like 1 Peter 2 tells us to put aside all the sinful stuff, the malice and the wickedness and so forth. And it says to earnestly desire the sincere milk of the word. So we are to come to the word for its nutritious, spiritually life-giving qualities. And that's what he's talking about here. Speaking the truth in love that we may grow up in all things. When people don't have good nutrition physically, what happens? Well, they don't grow up to the full stature. I still remember when Romania opened up around about 1989, 1990. Nicolae Ceausescu was the Marxist communist dictator over Romania. And he made their people suffer greatly. And one of the things that happened under that system is they had these massive orphanages where they would stack up orphans like cordwood. And you went in when the cameras from our Western news agencies went in and filmed the interior of these places. There were people that looked like they were toddlers and they were really three and four years old. And you say, why does a three or four year old look like a one or two year old? What's up with that? And it's because they weren't being given any kind of care, any kind of proper love. They got the bare minimum of care to keep them alive. And they didn't grow. They didn't thrive in that sense. They didn't grow either intellectually or physically. And it's the same thing with church growth. When we're talking about our growth, the goal is here to grow up, to be an appropriate companion of the Lord for eternity. We're going to be with Christ forever. That's the big object of our lives. The big object isn't what career do I have? Where do I go to school? Or do I go to college? Or or any of that sort of thing. I'm not saying those things aren't important. But the big thing is, how do I grow in the faith so I can grow in my knowledge of the Son of God, so I can grow to become like Him? And we all, like the church, can attain to that and be presented with Him. 
forever and ever. There's these deceivers that don't want me to grow. They're trying to keep me from the nutrition. So what has to happen? We have to speak the truth in love. Now, this has been a much abused verse in the sense that sometimes people infer that to speak the truth in love means that I have to talk like this all the time. And I'm just going to tell you all how wonderful you are and what nice people you are and how good it is to have you at church. Now, doesn't that sound like speaking the truth in love? Except there are people on television that speak like that, that and they're not speaking the truth in love. They're speaking error in falsehood and deceit for greedy motives. And if their false gospel is believed, people will go to hell. That's not speaking the truth in love. Speaking the truth in love, it, it can be tough love sometimes. To, for someone who loves me to come and tell me, Keith, this is an intervention. What you're doing is going to kill you. I need to tell you because I love you. Stop doing this thing that you're doing. It's dangerous. It's bad. That's speaking the truth in love. I'm not saying we always have to be harsh. I'm certainly not saying that we must be rude. But speaking the truth in love means that we hold that truth out with no ulterior motive and no guile, with the sincere desire for our brother or sister to grow in the Lord Jesus Christ, to be preserved from error and to grow up into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. You see, he says in verse 16, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. What that's all saying is, every part of the body is working to this end to make us grow up, or at least it ought to be. No vestigial organs in the body of Christ. No organ that doesn't have a job. We are to do our job that the body might grow. We are to do this job in love so the church grows up together in love. And what that job is, again, is going to depend on the gifts, talents, abilities, and opportunities that the Lord gives you. I can't sit here and tell you or stand here and tell you what it's going to be. We have to just follow the Lord and let him use us. But we're all in this together. And we're all part of this. And we all need to be active in building up the body in love. And so may God help us to do so. Father, we're thankful for thy word this morning. It's sublime to think of the great heights that the church is going to reach to be like and with the Lord forever. But we realize growth is a process and it's ongoing in this world. And we sometimes think about kids that grow up in tough neighborhoods and our heart goes out to them. We're growing up in a very tough neighborhood as the church. That worldwide, this scene is not conducive to spiritual growth. And there's error all around. And men that would seek to trick us. So we pray, Father, help us to hold to the truth, the faith, and to earnestly contend for it and to speak the truth in love. Let us not waver from this or back off. Let us be bold and empowered by thy spirit and yet not be rude and abusive while we do it. Give us wisdom like our Lord to be full of grace and truth. We ask it in the Lord Jesus Christ's name. Amen.